Hello, mathematicians. This is Mr. Garcia with a new video, a new lesson. This is lesson 3.4, which is on axiom, postulates, and theorems. What we're going to do in this video is just fill out the notes that we have assigned for you in case you miss the Zoom class. You still have an opportunity to fill these notes out and submit them. So we're going to go through and we're going to fill out our notes while learning about what axiom, postulates, and theorems are. But first, we're going to talk real quick about mathematical proofs. So last time in lesson 3.3, we talked about what a math mathematical proof is, an argument that convinces other people that something is true. We did the example with the UNO cards, and we saw that we did those proofs in a two-column format, where the step statements are on the left-hand side, and the justifications and reasons are on the right-hand side. Now, in order to write more complete geometric proofs, we're going to be using axioms, postulates, and theorems as our reasons, our justifications for these proofs. So we're going to need to refer back to these notes a lot while we're doing proofs especially. So make sure you keep this in your Google Drive somewhere where you know where it's at somewhere you can find easily because we will be using these later in the future. So to start, we're going to talk about postulates and axioms. Postulates and axioms are statements that are assumed to be true. They don't need to be proven. They just assume that they are true. Postulates are relevant to the subject, which in this case is geometry. So postulates that we use are geometric in nature because they are relevant to geometry. While axioms are more general true statements, axioms can apply even outside of geometry. So axioms are more for general cases and postulates are more specific. They're more relevant to one type of mass over another. So let's talk about some of our postulates and some of our axioms. Through any two points, and I'm highlighting everything that I replaced so you guys will be able to identify it. Remember, you can always pause the video if you miss something or if I'm going to pass. So through any two points, there is exactly one line. Anytime I have two points, there is exactly one and only one line that passes through those two points. Now through any three non-collinear points, there is exactly one plane. Remember that the word non-collinear means that these three points are not on the same line. They are all on different lines. So if I have any three points that are non-collinear, then those three points can form exactly one plane. We kind of talked about these two way back in undefined terms. So that's where that knowledge comes from, the two axioms here. A line contains at least two points. A plane contains at least three non-collinear points. Three and four, postulates three and four here, can be thought of as the converse of postulates one and two. Because while it looks like they're saying the same thing, it's actually slightly different. So let's move on to postulate number five. If two points lie on a plane, then the entire line containing those points lies also in that plane. 
is just saying that if two lines are on a plane, then the line that goes through those two points is on that same exact plane. If two lines, going on to postulate six, if two lines intersect, then their intersection is exactly one point. Two lines intersect. If two lines cross, then where they intersect will be exactly one point. Postulate number seven. If two planes intersect, if I have two flat surfaces that intersect, then their intersection is a line. Now remember that these seven statements do not have to be proven true. They are just statements that can be observed to be true. Like postulate number one, through any two points, there is exactly one line. We know that to be true. We can see that. Now, theorems, on the other hand, down here, theorems are propositions that have been proven true by a chain of reasoning. So theorems don't start off as true. Theorems will actually begin their life as conjectures, as hypotheses, as guess. And through rigorous testing using two column proofs, we can turn a conjecture into a theorem if we prove that to be true. So in contrast to postulates, theorems have to be proven true before we can use them. So let's take a look at some of the examples of theorems that we have. Now, these are not all the theorems that we'll have, but these are some that are most commonly used in two-column proofs to prove another theorem or to prove something else. So the first theorem we have is the midpoint theorem that tells us if point M is the midpoint of segment AB, then segment AM is congruent to segment MB. Now we haven't really seen this symbol around the equal sign with the wavy line on the top, which is called a tilde. That symbol means congruent. And the way that we read this statement right here is segment AM is congruent to segment MB. Now we'll talk about what that congruence means in a little bit down here. So let's read the next theorem, which is the congruence theorem for segments. If segment AB is congruent to segment CD, then AB equals CD. Now this might look a little bit confusing because it looks like it's saying the exact same thing, right? What we understand, what we need to understand about congruence is that congruence deals with objects while equality deals with numbers. So think of it this way. If I say that two segments are congruent, what that means is that these two segments are the same. They're the exact same. I just made copies of them and moved them around to different places. But congruent means it's the same segment. Equality, if I say that this segment is equal to this segment, then I'm not talking about the segments themselves. I'm talking about the length of those segments. So saying that segment AB is equal to segment CD means that if AB is like three inches, then CD will also be three inches. Now what this tells us is, if I tell you that two segments are congruent, then you know they're going to have the same length. That's what this congruence theorem for segments is telling us. The same applies for the congruence theorem for angles. If angle ABC is congruent to angle DEF, then the measure of angle ABC is equal to the measure of angle DEF. So again, congruence means that these two angles are exactly the same. You can take one of these angles 
put it over the other one and they'll line up perfectly. That doesn't, well, according to this theorem, that means that their measure is also equal. So if this angle ABC is, so let's say 50 degrees, then angle DEF will also be 50 degrees as long as we know that those two angles are congruent. So it's kind of a tricky difference, but that is the difference there. Congruence deals with the objects themselves, while equality deals with the numbers involved with that object, their measures, their lengths, whatever it might be. We also have three properties that we'll use often in proofs. The transitive property tells us if A equals B, where A and B and C are just some numbers that can represent a length or something else. But if A equals B and B equals C, then A is also equal to C. So think about it. If I know that A and B are the same, and I know that B and C are the same, then obviously A and C have to be the same. That's what the transitive property here is telling us. Moving on, the reflexive property says that segment AB, for example, is congruent to segment AB. Now, this looks unusual, right? It's the exact same thing. Well, yeah. Segment AB is congruent to segment AB. Because they're the same, they have to be the same. Now, while it looks weird now, when we use it in proof, it'll make more sense. Because the reflexive property is used when, for example, I have two triangles that have a segment overlapping in between. In fact, I can draw a real quick example to show you what that looks like. Let's say that I have a triangle like this one. And let's say that I have a line going through the middle of this triangle. I could still say that it's one triangle, but actually it's split into two. This middle line is used as a side for both of these triangles. Now imagine that instead of cutting one triangle in half, I got two triangles that look exactly the same, that are congruent like this, and I line them up back to back like this. In the real world, if you did that, it wouldn't be just be one line. You'd have a separate line from each triangle, right? But they share the same points. So that's why we say that AB is congruent to AB. Because one AB, it could be from the left-hand triangle, and the other AB could be from the right-hand triangle. So that's what that reflexive property means. And finally, the symmetric property tells us if A equals B, then B equals A. So they are the same. You just flip them around and they remain the same to each other. And that is it for the notes, guys. So again, if you missed something, rewind the video, go back. If you have any questions, reach out to us, let us know so we can help you out. Don't forget to do your activity. If you're in Caddy's class, you're doing your 3.4 exit ticket. If you're in my class, you're going to finish the decimals activity. All right. Have a good day, guys, and we'll see you guys in class. Take care.